Good afternoon. We'll get started in just one minute. Let the last few folks come in. All right, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming to Innovate Bio webinar series that's focused on CRISPR. We're very excited for this three-part series that's running for the remaining Fridays in January. Today we have a presentation from BioRad and there will be a follow-up presentation being made by BioRad next week. And then the third Friday, we have um, a presentation from Delaware Technical Community College and their partners at Christiana Care um, coming to talk about the work that they have been doing with CRISPR as well. Um, I'm Heather Bach. I'm the project director for Innovate Bio. I just have a couple housekeeping tips before we get started. The first is that we're going to ask everyone to stay muted during the presentation. If you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box. And there will be um, folks moderating those questions throughout the presentation. At the end, we anticipate there being time and opportunity for you to unmute and ask questions directly. We also have a live transcript available to you today. You can access that by hitting the live transcript box on the bottom of your Zoom menu bar and selecting show subtitle. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be shared through the Innovate Bio website. And as a registrant, you will also get the direct link to the recording in an email early next week. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Lee Brown. Hello everyone, how are you? Um, I am Lee Brown, I'm here with a few colleagues today, so some of you may be familiar with us. Um, I'm currently uh, a curriculum and training specialist for BioRab based in Texas, um, Central Texas, just south of Austin, between San Antonio and Austin. And I have Damon Ty here. Um, there's a lot of you here, so he can wave. And if you see him on your grid, then that's um, uh, Damon's based in the Bay Area. I know he knows a lot of you guys because your names are familiar. Um, we have Yolanda, who is somewhere. There she is. It's like those, uh, that game show, what was that game? Hollywood Squares. Um, so Yolanda's here. She's one of our uh, magical web people and marketing people that helps us get our kits launched and put them on the web. And she's also really, really great at writing curriculum. She was essential in writing our biotechnology book, which I know a lot of you are um, familiar with. And I think we have George here. Um, and George is one of our R&D scientists. And he is the one that developed this kit. So um, whenever I have any questions that I can't answer, I usually ping George and he helps. Um, so he's here for kind of tech support. And if you want to pick his brain about um, anything about the kit, you know, the, the technical bits and all that, we're actually going to have more in depth on the kit itself on the lab uh, next Friday. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Today we're just going to mainly take a look at um, the background of CRISPR and the applications of it. I'd love to hear from you guys about how you're using it. So let me add this in the chat and I'm hoping this works for you. Um, can someone click on that and, oh, hold on. I, I accidentally just sent it to one person. I apologize. Pornima, I'm just going to send it to you and let me know if it works. Looking at it. Did it open for you? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to send you guys to this link and I'm going to present in um, not presenter mode because I'm going to have you do some little interaction stuff here for a bit and then I'll switch over to the interactive mode if that's okay. Um, this will just allow you to kind of see what, how we tend to do things. Uh, with these Zoom polls and things like that. I know a lot of you are in a situation where you're uh, trying to teach remotely um, or doing a hybrid of that, right? And we all know how challenging it is. 
And so hopefully this will give you some good ideas on how you might want to do that with your classroom. So I'm going to go here and share my screen. Oops, hold on. I apologize. Let me go. I'm going to share a different screen. Sorry about that. More time. New share. And let me get back to this guy. Okay. And can you guys all see that um, PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Yolanda, George, Damon, um, and Pranima and Heather are all in the chat. So if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat and they're going to interrupt me and you know, we can, we can talk about them. We have plenty of time. So I don't think we're going to be scrambling to get done here. Um, but please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. And then one of them will just stop and interrupt and we can have a discussion. Or if it's just something that, you know, it may only affect you or you're kind of confused or not sure about something, you can always um, message one of those one of those three privately and they can help or you can just put it in the chat and they can answer it right there. So feel free to do that. Um, we have plenty of time to stop and answer questions too if you want to unmute yourself. Um, but hopefully we can, you know, get some get some interesting feedback from you guys. Okay, so um, I'm going to look at uh, our, oops, hold on, my computer's being slow here. There we go. Um, so these are the um, curriculum and training specialists. Damon and I are two of those. Like I said, I'm Central and Southeast U.S. Damon's West Coast. Um, Tamika is on the East Coast, especially Northeast Coast and kind of um, Ohio area up there. And then Aaron covers a lot of the country. Um, the three of us, Damon, me and Tamika, we cover kind of the bigger states and Aaron covers everything else. So he's going to cover the states, um, a lot of the states of the Midwest that we don't get a chance to go to. Um, you know, and it just he's kind of all over. So if you have any questions about this lab, you're welcome to just email that email address, explorer at biorad.com or this presentation, sorry, not just the lab. And one of us will get back to you and um, we'll get it routed to the right person, depending on what state you're in. Um, we're all, you know, happy to help out however we can. Uh, we also have a whole inside group at Biorad and Hercules that handles all of the quoting and things like that for community colleges. Um, the four of us handle all of the quoting uh, for high schools. So um, just so you understand, you know, where that kind of division is. Uh, we do help out at the community colleges. I know I've been to some of your community colleges before and led workshops um, back in the normal times. Uh, so hopefully we'll get back to doing that eventually. But right now things are weird. We are always happy to have these kinds of virtual workshops though. So if you want us to do that with your class or if you wanted to organize one with teachers, um, you can also email that that email address, explore at biorad.com, or if you know our emails, you're welcome to email us directly as well. We just, before so we we're going to be talking about our out of the blue CRISPR kit, and this is one that we just launched last year, I think probably the week before COVID hit, so that was really neat. Um, great timing. <laughs> We've been working on it for years and years, and it's... Um, you know, it, it was it was a labor of love, as George will tell you. Um, it took even longer to incubate than a baby, but um, uh, we're really, really proud of it. We're super excited, and we've been doing workshops on it all year over Zoom, just like this. Um, at the end of this workshop, we'll put up a link, and if you're interested in doing a hands-on workshop, then, then you can fill out that form, and uh, it's with the survey that Heather will put up. Um, and so if you wanted to do a hands-on one later on, um, you know, we're kind of gathering names from that to see how that goes as well. Okay, so we did win the best of show at NSTA uh, for, for um, new products. And if you want to go to our website and just download all the goodies, you can go to biorad.com slash out of the blue. And we have the resources, the manuals are there. They're free for you to download and look at. I'm going to be using some models, uh, paper models as well, and those are available too. Um, the paper models are ones that you can use with your students. You don't need to have the kit. It's a great way for you to just describe CRISPR and uh, have them model it. So we'll go through that later as well. Um, but it, that, that site is a really good resource and I'll show you some more resources at the end too. Lee, can you make the slides full screen? Well, I'm about to get to the interactive part. So I can't, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> after no that problem. I will though, that's okay, sorry. 
<laughs> okay, so here's the interactive part now. Um, the, the, now there's some way I can do it up here. Do you guys know? Here, 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 this one. Oh, it's making it the whole dang thing though. That might work. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, because I still need to have these over here or you guys won't be able to do anything if I'm in present mode. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the annotate tools in Zoom. Um, I'm just gonna go over a quick overview because I know everyone's not familiar with them uh, because they were, they were new to all of us when we learned about them back in the spring. But if you can see where the Zoom screen is and it says um, you're viewing Lee Brown's screen or Lee's lab, I'm not sure what it says now. Um, there's a thing right next to that that says view options. And if you click on that, you can choose annotate. Do you guys all see that? I want you to kind of do this with me if you don't mind. And then once you get to annotate, you'll bring up this other toolbar down here. And this toolbar has a function called stamp. So click on stamp and pick one of those things and just stamp on this thing. There you go, now you are doing it. Great, go to town. Okay, awesome, yay. Okay, terrific. Now, see where it says format? You can change the color if you want. You don't have to, but if you wanna be special, you can do that. Um, if you click on the arrow, that will actually put like a little like, flag with your name in it. So that's good to know for students, like if you want them to respond to a poll like this um, and they don't wanna type their name. Yeah, there you go, a lot of y'all are doing it, awesome. Then you can have them do the arrow and that automatically puts their name in there, right? Now, um, this is such great art, you guys, way to go. <laughs> it's a little Andy Warhol-esque. Um, so now, if as a teacher, you wanna get rid of all this stuff on your screen, I can hit clear. So I'm gonna hit um, clear on my end. I've got that annotate thing. I can hit clear, all drawings, and all of you go away. Now, if you keep drawing, it's gonna keep, you know, it'll keep staying on there. Um, so, but as a teacher, that's how you know how to get rid of it. The other thing is, is that you need to know that once you've selected the stamp tool, anytime you click anywhere, it's the stamp tool. So in order to get back to the regular mouse, you have to click the mouse button, right? So um, I've accidentally stamped on many a presenter's uh, presentation because I forgot to turn that off. It doesn't matter really, but um, anyway. So I want you guys to, I'm just gonna clear these. And then I'm going to go to this next slide. Whoops, I've got to go back to my mouse because I'm already on that. There we go. I'm gonna go to this next slide right here. And I would love for you guys to tell me what you're currently doing with CRISPR in your classroom. Um, you can use a stamp, you can use your name, whatever you wanna do. You could draw something if you're really super artsy and you just need an outlet on Friday afternoon. Um, are you doing anything at all? Are you, you know, maybe bring it up in a class or answer some questions, but you don't really cover it too much. Maybe you spend a whole lecture on it. Maybe you're doing a lab on it. Maybe your students are doing presentations on it. Um, so just go ahead and take a minute or so and kind of fill in there. You're welcome to type stuff if you want under that same annotate, annotate tool, there's a text tool. And if you want to type stuff with anything else to kind of tell us more about what you're doing, if it doesn't fit into one of these categories, let us know. So a lot of you are kind of doing not in depth. Some of you are doing extensively. When we return to school, we'll do it. One lecture, okay, awesome, awesome. Anyone else? And I can look in the chat too. The chat's always easier to check for um, uh, typing purposes. So let me look in there right quick. And if anyone has any other chat stuff that they wanna put in, let me know. Oh my gosh, where's my chat? Okay, I don't see my chat, sorry guys. Huh, that's weird. Okay, well, if there's anything cool in the chat, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'll just read the chat to you. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we've got someone saying that they use take home CRISPR kits. Nice. Another person says their students do their own research projects. Somebody bought the kit. Somebody had trouble ordering the kit. So maybe at some point you can connect with them. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, great, oh, yeah, great. Hi, Jim. So it's, it's a mix. 
Oh, good, good. Okay, that's great. So um, just like every other teacher I've talked to this semester or this this year, people are kind of all over the place, right? Like a lot of people, the, they've heard of CRISPR and they know it may have something to do with gene editing, but they're not quite sure. Um, some people are just all in, right? Students are doing independent research with CRISPR and it's everything in between. So we're just gonna kind of cover um, more of the basics. We're gonna keep it pretty simple. Um, this. I'm sure you've realized, I think Harvard has a, an online class on CRISPR the whole semester. So, you know, this could easily be a semester long class. And um, we're just trying to keep it uh, kind of really high level uh, enough where a um, biology student at the college level or an AP student in the high school level would have enough behind them to kind of understand the, the biological process of CRISPR and to um, be able to perform the lab. So that's kind of the goal of this presentation is to get you familiar enough with the process behind CRISPR, um, give you an idea of some of the applications of it, and get you comfortable enough so that when we talk about next week, what we're doing in the lab, your head doesn't explode, <laughs> right? Um, because CRISPR itself is not, uh, it, the, the process of it, the lab itself, the hands-on bit is really simple. But the bio biology behind it is takes a little thinking, right? Okay, so let me go to the next slide and now I can actually do the, hold on, present. Oh, look at that. Okay, hold on, it's thinking. Oh, hold on, <laughs> give me a second. I have to clear all you guys out. It doesn't stay on the, okay, clear all drawings. Okay, now everyone click on the mouse button so that if you do click on the slide, um, it doesn't go haywire, if you don't mind. Okay, let me get this over here right quick. There's the chat, the chat was behind another window. Okay, great, awesome. So let me hit present on this and we should be good to go. Someone let me know if that's not working. It's all black on my end, okay. Yes, it's working now. Okay, oh, Whoa. hang on. I don't know what's, what, I've never even seen this. I'm sorry, hold on. It switched over to the website. Oh my goodness, hold on, I'm sorry guys. There it is. I hit the wrong tab. Nope. Okay, what's happening here? So there we go. Okay. Now Okay, sorry about that. So today what we're going to cover is a few applications. Um there are endless ones. I'm going to let Damon talk about some of the ones that he's, you know, used with his students uh, when he does presentations with teachers. Um you know, last year when we used to be in the classroom and then this year when we're, when we're talking to students online, just as a way to kind of hook your students and also weave in all those topics. Um, CRISPR is a great way to kind of tie in all the molecular biology that, you, that you're already talking about likely in your biology course. Um, you can pull in bioethics, obviously. It's a great way to show um, students different biotechnology techniques. And so we'll talk about how to kind of integrate all that in your curriculum. We're gonna go into a little bit of depth, we're not exhaustive, but um, a little bit, just what you need to know to, to understand the mechanism of CRISPR-Cas9. And we'll also show you how to use that paper modeling activity. And again, that's for free. Um, I'll show you where it is on our website so you can download it. Welcome to download and use that with your students now and they can cut it out and use it or you can use the, the, the model that's in this PowerPoint, okay? So, um, Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So 
why teach CRISPR? You guys are probably already, you know, those of you who are teaching it um, are probably just teaching it because it's it's the hot new thing, right? This is pretty big stuff. This is the um, the biggest advancement that we've had in molecular biology since um, the invention of PCR, really, right? It's just that giant leap forward in what we can do with gene editing and how quickly and easy and precise it is. Um, so, that's you know the obvious of why teach CRISPR, but also you can use it when you're talking about um, bacterial immunity, right? So we'll talk a little bit about this later, but this is a form of bacterial immunity and that's how it was discovered. Um, you are able to show students this whole spectrum of how scientists discovered this uh, all the way through the applications, you know, the technology and applications that we're doing today. Um, and then probably one of the, the best reasons uh, recently is that uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for, for their work on CRISPR, okay? So lots of good reasons. The number of publications, I don't know if you've ever looked, we used to have a graph in here, but it, um, it's out of date, but uh, it's like a logarithmic graph of how many papers now are using CRISPR. And with COVID, we're seeing it skyrocket as well. So pretty cool. Okay, so here we are in the age of uh, genomic engineering, right? And we've been here for a while. Um, so, stu uh, I'm sorry, not students, but people have been genomically engineering things really since they started learning how to breed things, right? Um, but over time, of course, we've gotten more sophisticated. We've learned how to finesse things. We um, figured out how to manipulate genes more easily and how um, to manipulate them more precisely. That's kind of been the goal all along. Um, CRISPR is, like I said, that huge jump forward. So now we have a tool that's relatively inexpensive. Um, again, this is something that your students can do in their classroom and they really don't need any special um, technology to do it. I mean, a micro pipette would be great and an incubator, but nothing super fancy that you're not familiar with, right? And it's very easy to use. Um, and it's the, the, the biggest thing, the biggest reason that people use it is it's super precise. You can edit genes exactly where you want them to be edited in exactly the way that you want them to be edited, right? So that's, that's really the power of CRISPR here. Okay. Oh wait, let me clear off the stars. Did it work? There they go, okay. So uh, you've probably seen something, some kind of engineering diagram that looks similar to this, right? There's all kinds of iterations here. And if you think about how CRISPR is this tool that we can kind of insert into any of these places, right? Um, then you can really start to think about the power of CRISPR. So if we're looking to, um, you know, let's just start with imagining solutions. So we might want to think about how we can um, edit genes in a really precise way, um, in a very specific way, and we can um, think about what we want to edit, right? So then we can, you know, design solutions around that, um, and those are going to, you know, be through the use of CRISPR, they're going to be more cost effective, um, very targeted, very specific, um, and then, you know, will create those solutions, actually carry them out. They'll likely need to be revised, right? So there's always, it's never the first one and done sort of situation, doesn't happen very often in science. So we can revise those solutions. Um, and then, oh, sorry, I'm gonna start with define problems. So define the problem that we're trying to solve in the first place. Um, revise that solution, and then just keep on going in this circle, right? So this whole engineering process is, um, part, a, a key part of CRISPR. And as scientists use CRISPR in their work, they're kind of going through this cycle and refining it, um, using CRISPR to, to come up with solutions um, and to, to create solutions, revising those, and then kind of repeating and repeating until they get the, the result that they need, uh, that they're looking for, okay? So, um, let me go to the next slide. What do you need to, oh, sorry. 
what exactly do you need to know in order to do CRISPR with your students? What do you need to know for this age of genomic engineering? Uh, well, it's probably stuff that you're already teaching your students right now. So it's a good idea that they know the basics of DNA and RNA and protein, right? So the basics of molecular genetics at a, at a minimum. Um, it's always good for them to understand the structure and function of proteins, okay? And in the lab, we'll talk about that as well. And um, cell biology and systems biology are, are going to come in handy as well so that they can understand what processes are involved in the gene editing, um, especially if you're talking about, um, you know, the design of the, the guide RNAs and things like that um, uh, and how they are working and how, how, the, how those genes are being cut, targeted, and um, repaired, okay? So... Probably all stuff that you're already covering. This is a great way to put a application to all of those um, ideas that are sometimes kind of abstract and hard to, for students to really visualize. Okay. So now I want to just spend some time talking about some of the applications. Damon, do you mind covering some of this stuff? Yeah, I can help out. Awesome, awesome. Take it away. So, um, a lot of times when I go and I talk to high schools, usually as a guest speaker, I've got this slide deck on biotech history. And I always kind of like watch for like what things usually hook the students. And usually when we get to kind of, you know, what the future potential of some of these technologies are, these are the slides that usually kind of draw them in. So that's why I kind of put it in this slide deck for talking about CRISPR. So there's been a lot of talk about using CRISPR in de-extinction projects. And so these are basically projects where people are going to try to bring back organisms um, that have gone extinct. Usually stuff, you know, from the last kind of ice age forward because otherwise it's really hard to get usable DNA. So one of the most high profile um, projects has been a kind of a, a two-fold look at doing a de-extinction project around the woolly mammoth. And so you've got George Church, the big bearded guy there on the left, um, who's interested in the woolly mammoth from a conservation or an ecology point of view, which is people are talking about wanting to have something like a woolly mammoth back up in the northern latitudes as basically uh, climate change warms the tundras and things like that. We're having these giant methane dumps that are going on in the atmosphere. And a lot of people have speculated that if we could turn those into grasslands really quickly, it could minimize the effect of that methane dumping. So Church has kind of looked at this and said, well, we want something like a woolly mammoth, but you know, bringing back that whole genome is I mean, possible potentially, but a lot of work. But if we compare this genome versus the Asiatic elephant, there's basically like, a, I think it was like a nine to 12 gene difference. Can we just move those 12 genes more or less and cold adapt an Asiatic elephant to get something that is from an ecological point of view, like the woolly mammoth. And then there's actually Beth Shapiro's group out of UC Santa Cruz that was actually interested in trying to recapitulate the entire kind of woolly mammoth genome. And that might be possible because you got to remember, we do have really good mammoth DNA. There's been a couple mammoths that were found more or less kind of, you know, frozen and their DNA was relatively intact. Um, and so this is one of the de-extinction projects that's kind of very high profile. Uh, Lee, why don't you go to the next slide? Uh -huh. There we go. Oh, sorry, I went too far. There it is. Oh. Did it work? Yep. All right. So the first one, though, that I think would probably actually work with a large organism in North America will probably be the passenger pigeon. And it's mainly because we've got great DNA on this, not just good, okay DNA. I mean, we literally had the last one more or less die in somebody's hand at the, I think it was the Cleveland Zoo in September 1st, 1914. So great DNA on it. And one of the big reasons people want to bring this back, it was obviously a major ecological force for Eastern forests. Um, you had these things that, you know, basically moved in packs large enough that people said they, they blocked out the sun. So you've got to imagine that these were major structures in forest ecology for the East Coast. Um, so there is a guy, Nick Novak, uh, I think he's also at Santa Cruz, who's working on bringing back the passenger pigeon and doing this via taking the genome that we have for the passenger pigeon and then comparing that against the most recent or most closely related organism still alive, which is the band-tailed pigeon. Um, so where they don't have full segments of the passenger pigeon genome, they're hoping to more or less be able to CRISPR out pieces from band-tailed and drop it in uh, to reconstruct chromosomes from this. Um, so that will probably be, I'd say, one of the, for, for me, that's my biggest hope as far as a de-extinction project coming to fruition will be that one. 
Um, on the other side of it, um, you've got people that are bringing stuff back in these kind of de-extinction projects, and there's people that are trying to, I wouldn't say necessarily extinct, but you know, locally dampen the amount of an organism. Um, and this is where you see kind of gene drives uh, being in, uh, uh, being used to usually get rid of a you know a human kind of pathogen vector. And so we think about this when we think about kind of mosquitoes or TT flies things like that. And gene drives are basically ways that you can propagate a downstream kind of lethal effect um, within a population. Um, and so this is kind of a, a next level um, adjustment to, if you remember how TT flies or even some mosquitoes, they were taking and basically hitting them with enough radiation damage that males had very kind of fragile genomic structures and would breed with females and then cause offsprings that weren't viable. That though, you have to continually kind of rebuild those beat up males. With gene drives, you could literally kind of put a smaller population out there and have that kind of propagate itself through a couple of generations before dampening that population. Um, and so more or less, they kind of work like this. You've got your um, uh, Cas9, your guide RNA, and then your cargo um, built into um, a section of the genome. And that cargo is something that's usually lethal once you have um, uh, two copies of it in the genome. And so it allows this thing, the CRISPR system more or less allows it to kind of pick it up and then move it um, to new um, chromosomes and, or sorry, to, to new sites when, when breeding is taking place. And so that way you can propagate this allele until you get it to a high density where then it's causing basically lethality within the population. Go ahead and go to the next one, Lee. All right. Oops, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. There we go. Um, but then, oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Is that right? Those, so things that are kind of being looked at for extinction projects, um, you could go after the actual organism itself or you could go after the vector. Um, so in the case of like Lyme disease, um, there's an interesting way about going about this. Instead of doing a gene drive that's actually, say, killing an organism, what they're trying to do is propagate a gene drive that would give the white-footed mouse more or less a transferable kind of vaccine against being able to propagate the spirochetes involved in Lyme disease. And that's mainly because they're a big intermediate host. Um, and so this is one um, that's going on right now. They're just trying to find a location in order to test this. I believe the guy is out of MIT or Harvard that's trying to do this. And ultimately they're looking actually to kind of get a small population on one of the islands off of the East Coast to then do this with. It's easy to control and then study how it would affect the ultimate uh, level of Lyme disease in the population of ticks by more or less having these white-footed mice all become resistant to carrying uh, the spirochete. MIT, thank you, Crystal. Go ahead and go to the next one, Lee. I, I was going to say, I don't, I, I've watched so many CRISPR documentaries and videos now, I can't remember which one it is, but there's a really good one. It might be the Netflix one where the guy is working with um, an island, East Coast, I want to say, um, and talking about the, the, the cost benefit to releasing um, uh, mosquitoes, right, CRISPR mosquitoes into the population. Um, are are y'all familiar with that, which one that is? Yeah, it's it just Jim said, yeah, it's unnatural selection. And I think the I think the island one though, I think it was they were doing the white footed mice there. They were doing the mice, that's right, that's right. And, I think, and so the, I think it's Martha's Vineyard, I think is where where he was trying to target. It was Martha's or or Block Island, one of those two that's, that's right. But that was a really interesting one to talk to watch um from a just the public perspective of having them understand the science and um the the pros and cons of this new technology and um, it's a big struggle, right? So that was a really interesting side of CRISPR, I thought, to, to see. Okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's actually, that unnatural selection um, specific episode is great, especially this storyline, because it gets really down into the ethics of this, especially when you talk about things that you're more or less potentially letting out into ecological systems, right? And so this guy from MIT, he's trying to do the right thing here, right? Which is find a way they can control it, get people that are near this and that might be affected by it to buy into it. And so it's not just like a rogue scientist coming in and being like, I'm just gonna modify your mice through a couple of gene drives out there and then like walk away and see what happens. So he's really trying to kind of do the appropriate ethical steps through it, which is a really interesting thing 
I think, to model for students too, because you know we all get caught up in like, well, what can we do with this technology? And there, you always have to stop and ask the question of what can we do and what should we do? Mm -hmm. And how do you make sure that everyone's on the same page that might be affected by this technology? Um, really good piece. And if you haven't seen Unnatural Selection and you enjoy seeing Dim, Jim DeClos face, um, he is also in that. He gets a little cameo, I believe, in episode two. Um, so I missed it's Jim. What, what, they, I, I missed that. I'm going to have to go back and look for him now. That's awesome. Yeah. OK. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Here we go. Let's let's let them answer. Okay. okay. Add in the chat. What do you think humans really want to modify? <laughs> okay, I'm seeing a lot of ourselves, disease, get rid of Alzheimer's, acne. that cause acne. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Of, of super interest to students, right? Improve my metabolism. I love it. Erin, I'm with you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Babies create superhumans. Someone looked ahead in the PowerPoint slide, I feel like. <laughs> X-Men, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, X-Men. Um, Jim says, for those of you that aren't in the chat, um, it seems to me there's no bioethics objections for genetic disorders. I feel like I, one of my one of my good friends teaches bioethics at a university in Arizona, and he has a whole class on just this topic. I mean, it is such a dicey, um, you know, it seems like like it's a no brainer to repair genes for um, lethal diseases, but at some point there's some gray area, right? And so um, it, it's always just a, kind of a interesting thing, yeah, germline modification. Okay, so let's go forward a little bit, okay. And just kind of to one, one stem on there that I see a lot of like high schools do is if they kind of go into that region, right, of like, well, should we, you know, what do you guys think about getting rid of like inheritable genetic diseases or variations that cause disease? You know, most kids are like, their first impulse is like, well, yeah, let's, let's get rid of them, right? Then you bring up a couple of these, you know, more or less kind of storylines that we talk about a lot in biology, like malaria, right? You go, here's a disease, but there's also an advantage at some point, right? When you're not homozygous, but you're heterozygous for this, you know, you're, you're, there's an advantage. And so, you know, where's that balance? Because there's hubris that comes in, right? Where we're like, we're just gonna wipe out this thing, but maybe that thing also confers a benefit to some, to some place within human biology. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic talk to get into with students because it's, it makes it, for them where they realize it's not quite as black and white. There's a lot of like, you know, little tiny things you gotta look at to make sure um, something you're going after isn't gonna cause harm too in the overall population. So yes, most usually humans want to kind of modify humans ultimately. And you see a lot of that with the, even with what you guys chip forward. And definitely if you ask students this, most of them that's kind of like their first thought too because they've been watching x-men and things like that and they're like i would love to have knives shoot out of my hands and you know be able to spin webs and things like that um and that really boils down to a lot of like kind of designer baby type of stuff too so we talk about disease prevention and then we you know things like cognitive enhancement and then you get into more like potential fad type things right like eye color and you know kind of uh, morphology type of stuff so go ahead and go to the next one lee I think cognitive, advan uh, cognitive advancement is one of the um, gray area ones, right? You can see a, a case yeah. for um, um, helping to some degree, but at what point do you stop, right? So that's uh, there's a lot of cases like that. Um, you know, I think eye color is probably frivolous for everyone, right? Um, but there's a lot of these kind of gray area things that are. Um, more like, well, if it's if it's super low or super high, that can be detrimental. But at some time in the middle, where where do we stop, or where where do we consider it, you know, kind of borderline ethically? Okay. Right. And especially, I mean, a lot of those come with a lot of unknowns, right? Because like we don't understand, we understand human biology quite well, but we don't understand at the at the level that would probably allow us to do manipulation safely. So like, if you're going after cognitive advantage, I mean, the chance of causing mental disorders is pretty high. I mean, yeah. you know, like schizophrenia and things like that could happen relatively easy with dopamine changes, right, in different regions. Um, and some of those regions are ones that when there is a lot of dopamine there, there's a lot more kind of creativity going on. So there's like, you know, madness and intelligence, right, are pretty close and, and stacked a lot of times. Um, 
So for students, I usually ask them, like these are questions to kind of get their bioethics kind of triggered a little bit in thinking, you know, what is it like for the parents, you know, who are trying to modify the child? Because like usually a parent, right? They want to do the best for the kid. And so that's what they're trying to do. But imagine being on the other side of that and being that kid and you know that your, your parents have made specific modifications to you, hoping to get a specific trait out of you. Um, and that's actually a really hard one, I think, to kind of do like, put yourself in that position, think about what that would be like. Um, and then also what edits, you know, should or should not be allowed, who also gets to make those decisions. Um, you know, are we going after genetic disorders? You know, do we after intelligence, behavioral attributes? How does this ultimately affect the gene pool? I know we a lot of times think about this as individual choice, but we are a big species and we've got this giant population and you do want to affect, think about how that actually affects the overall gene pool and fitness of the species. Um, and then of course, the big one, eugenics. How do you not, how do you keep modifications from becoming a slippery slope into basically round three of eugenics? Um, and that's a really, really tough one. And I think a really important thing to always bring out there for students, uh, it's mainly because we have a very biased education in the United States. If any of them have ever heard about eugenics, you know, you ask them like, where have you heard about it from? And they're like, oh, the Nazis. And you're like, yes. And who was castrating people because they had three felonies before the Nazis? Hello, America. Used to get, because we thought felony behavior was a genetic problem. And so if you wanted less felons, you would just go through and snip, snip, take them out of the uh, population. And it wasn't until um, Skinner versus Oklahoma. And I think that was like in the mid forties, the guy got caught stealing chickens for the third time in his life. And the judge decided that like, hey, maybe we shouldn't castrate him over this or uh, Buck versus Bell. So if you were a woman and you gave birth to uh, two or more children, the state at the time called retarded, um, you would also be castrated. And to be honest, like I don't think Buck versus Bell has completely been removed from some of the state registers um, either. It just isn't practiced, but I mean, there's a lot of this stuff if you go into the legal system, eugenics is still kind of written in as stuff that can happen. Um, and so, I mean, a very, a very big thing we have to think about is how do even these things where we're trying to get rid of diseases not slip into being like third wave, very precise eugenics movements? Okay. All right, go ahead and go to the next one, Lee. So, so do you want me to go back one? Uh, I don't know, because I didn't see that end of that one before, I guess. This is the, this was here and then this, this is, I'm just still seeing the same slides. So I'm just gonna go here. Uh oh, is it not? Uh, we didn't get here overnight, right? Like most technologies, <laughs> right? Like, and this is like one of the things that I think people are starting to finally do really well with the current vaccines going out, that people aren't as like freaked out. It's like, we didn't get to these mRNA vaccines overnight. Like this has been a long process. Same thing with CRISPR and potential modification of humans using CRISPR. We didn't get here overnight. I would say these are kind of like four major stepping points. Um, if you're looking at the history of it, it's so 1978, we've got that first in vitro fertilization event, which means you can finally take eggs out, so you can take sperm out, you could do, well, sperms are easier to get out, you can do things with them, put them back together, and then put them um, in somebody and bring them to term, which means there's then the possibility of modifying either one of those cell lines for that. And then 2012, of course, kind of CRISPR-Cas9 more or less becomes a very obvious protocol that can be used. 2015, you start to get modifications actually in non-viable human embryos coming out of China. And then of course the US at this time is going, we will never allow that to happen. And then China publishes this paper and the US is kind of like, ah, well, you know, a couple of you guys, a couple of places can start working on this. And then of course, 2018, when you have Dr. He uh, basically say, hey, we've modified, you know, two or more children um, in order to make them so they can never contract HIV. Um, the other things on the modification side, you've got, of course, restriction enzymes, right? These are your first basic tools on modifying genomes come along in the mid 60s, 80, 83, or in the 80s, you kind of get recombinant going on. But really, I'd say the ones to focus on that were kind of the big jumps, where like all of a sudden we've got some precision, but they're pain in the butt, are in the 80s, also kind of zinc finger nucleases come online as a big tool. And then in the mid 2000s, talons. But both of these were really precise, but also a pain to use. 
Um, and so that's why modifications were taking place, but you didn't see them at this grand scale at the way that we're gonna see with CRISPR because CRISPR is just so darn easy to then do um, these genomic modifications with high precision. Um, and so why is CRISPR so exciting? It is that low cost, it is that ease of use, and that potential for highly targeted editing, right? Imagine if you're trying to edit the human genome using restriction enzymes, good luck, right? You've got a handful of locations you go to and cut. Um, it's not that precision, but with uh, CRISPR, you've got that. Um, and then, like I said, like the ease of use is a big thing. I mean, you guys can literally do this in your classroom. I mean, I think the BioRide kit, you basically need like some hot water, a place to grow bacteria. That's basically it, you know? So, and that's why scientists are really excited about that because you combine ease of use and low cost. That means you can do automation with this and you can do massive parallel editing projects uh, to really kind of tweak with stuff. Yeah, so uh, to Damon's point, you can do um, essentially multiplexing with CRISPR as well. So you don't have to just confine yourself to one um, gene or target area that you want to edit, you can do multiple ones at a time, just like, you know, if you think of multiplexing and PCR, we're picking up three targets with three different primer sets. Um, CRISPR, you can do that as well. So uh, it's, it's, you know, a really, really powerful tool um, and uh, very elegant too. Okay. So this is looking at, um, now let's take a step back and kind of talk about Oh, great. You know, I've identified this thing I want to fix. I want to adjust something, um, you know, that's causing a, a problem or a disease or, or something in humans. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, just tweak this one protein that's being made. Maybe we have too much of it. Um, so it's not always that simple, right? We don't necessarily get to just think of um, all of the pathways in our system, uh, all of the pathways in the human body as an isolated thing. They're all interacting. Um, so if you do say um, you want to modify the system and get more fumarate out of it, right? Well, maybe we get rid of the fumarase or we, we lower how, how much of that's expressed. Um, well, um, you could also add in more of that succinate dehydrogenase, right? So that would help it as well. Um, there's all kinds of things that are going to happen downstream of that uh, process that you need to take into account too. And then if we zoom out even further, <laughs> this is meant to be uh, terrifying, um, but it's, it's not just that one cycle that you're looking at, it's how that cycle interacts with all of the other processes in our body. And so it's a really a complex um, thing to start thinking about, you know, you're looking at modifying one gene or even one, um, uh, you know, that you think might have a limited effect, but how does that actually play out in our systems? How are those pathways all interconnected? And what happens, uh, what are the ramifications when you modify just one uh, gene in one pathway, right? Or, you know, the output of one protein in one pathway? What kind of downstream mod uh, ramifications do we have all over the body. Um, and a, a lot of this is just a question mark. Some things we know, there's a lot that we still don't know. Um, so it's it's tricky. Um, so, whoops, hold on. Get here. There, oh, there we go. Okay, so take a second here, and this is something, you know, for your students, but I'd love for you to just take a minute or, or so, put stuff in the chat, um, or if you if you want to turn your um, tool, your annotate tool back on, I think I'm not in presentation mode, I think you can still click on things, maybe, I don't know, but you're welcome to write stuff on here if you want, or write them in the chat. Um, what do you think our biggest concerns are about genomic engineering? What are, what are some of the big scary concerns that you might have? Or what do you think your students might be most concerned about going forward from where we are right now? <laughs> Mistakes. Someone's much better with their mouse cursor than I am. Someone says off target effects. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that even more next week, but yeah. So something that you uh, 
you design a guide RNA to target a specific gene and um, it does, it, 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 you know, you can edit that one gene, but it also accidentally binds to somewhere that you didn't intend for it to bind. Cuts that gene, we edit that one too, Ugh, that's a big problem. So um, the researchers spend a lot of time making sure that they aren't gonna have those off-target effects. Um, that's That can be detrimental. International laws, Damon brought up the, the Chinese researcher. So he's uh, spending three years in jail now because of that um, genome editing that he did for the, the babies. Um, they were modifying a protein that makes them more susceptible to HIV infection. So he was getting rid of that. Um, there's a lot of questions, right? We don't know what else could happen. Um, the big argument was that those babies weren't at high risk of getting HIV. Um, so um, anyway, there's a lot of concerns about this for humans. Um, it depends on who's working on it, right? Like uh, we know there's bad actors out there. So um, the technology is pretty easy. How do we get it, you know, make sure that it stays in the right hands? Um, let's see. Okay, Jim DeClose says, in the future, the fact that you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. I think that's a really accurate way to, to, to sum it up, right? Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, okay, so I'm looking on here to gene drives escaping target populations, um, germline editing, let's see, eugenics, of course, engineering for bad, yes, those bad actors escape bacteria. Okay, great. Yeah, this is one, one of the things that I've done with students as we're kind of talking about CRISPR is we have spent a class, rather than me coming up with ideas for applications, we're going to talk a little bit more about applications here in a minute too, but rather than me just coming up with ideas and saying, you know, here's where CRISPR is being used, um, I might give them one or two and then I just kind of cut them loose for the class period and let them pull out their phone, pull out their iPad, look on the computer, um, and find what cool CRISPR application is out there that they want to present on. They make one PowerPoint slide, they spend 20 minutes with their partner, and then they present it to the class. And so the stuff that interests them, it, it's it's so interesting because it's I learn stuff every time I've done that. Um, they're always really interested in CRISPR edited dogs. Uh, that's a very popular one and um, all kinds of diseases, right? Um, we're about to get into crops. That's another really big one. Um, but that's a good way to have your students do it. It doesn't take any time. They can find a million different applications, you know, in the first four pages of Google, I feel like. So, okay. So let me clear you guys off. Thank you for that input. And whoop, give me one second here. There we go. Okay, I've got to move all my windows so I can see everything. Okay, I think I skipped one. Oops, there we go. Okay, how can you prepare students for the decisions they're going to make as a society with these technologies? This is a big one for really all the science that we're teaching students, right? Um, would it be great if they all grew up to be uh, scientists and doing research and you know solving all the world's problems? That'd be fantastic. Lord knows we need them right now. Um, but at a minimum, we want them to be informed uh, citizens. We want them to understand technology and not be scared of it. And so having students um, understand the, the, the tools that scientists are using and the implications of them is really critical because they're going to be voting on this stuff, right? We're all going to be voting on this kind of stuff um, eventually, or um, at least deciding who is determining whether or not uh, this kind of technology can proceed. We might be voting for the people who make those decisions, right? Um, there's likely to be some situations like um, the, the white-footed mouse where in certain communities, scientists want to release genetically engineered or, or CRISPR organisms. And so it's good to, for them to have that science background and that understanding before um, they get blindsided, because this is a lot for them to understand, right? So, okay. Now let's talk about a few more applications. So, um, oops, hold on, I've got to rearrange this. Um, so, you know, one of the major things that people really want to do is work on um, fixing some diseases or some uh, work on, on, on 
treatments, right? Cancer treatment's a really big one. Um, so, you know, we're going to kind of switch gears from the, oh my gosh, the world is going to end if we, if we, you know, use CRISPR to, uh, some of the ways that CRISPR is already being used and how it's helping us now, right? Um, so this is one of the most exciting applications of CRISPR that we have right now is the CAR T cell therapy and CRISPR's being used to kind of, um, focus your immune system and train it a bit. So it is um, able to target cancer cells, okay? And again, there's all kinds of different um, CAR T cell therapy. George is, an, is somewhat of an expert on this, I feel like. Um, George, do you, want, do you mind just talking just real briefly about this in CRISPR? I'm gonna put him on the spot. Uh, I would not say I am an expert on this, but I do know a little bit about it. Uh, so what's amazing about this treatment is that you take a patient's own cells, modify them, and then put them back into the patient. And you really have to get a very specific population of cells when you're doing this. So you really wanna have something that's very, very effective in changing these cells. The more effective it is, the better it is. That's why CRISPR is very nice for this. Now you don't have to use CRISPR for this because well, all you're doing is uh, doing some gene editing in these T cells you're converting them from these normal T cells that will you know, be targeting invading cells. But instead what you do is you have these cancer cells and cancer cells are a unique population depending on the type of cancer. And so you, you look at these cancer cells and you can do this personalized medicine where you say this population of cancer cells is showing this very one specific protein. And you take that and you put that as the target for your T cells. Now you put these T cells back in the body and that's these T cells are gonna attack and kill anything that is making this peptide that's presented on the cell surface and then it's gonna go and kill the cancer cells. Now you have to find a very unique target because you know, if you say, pick a you know, cardiac cell that has this exact same epitope, these T cells are gonna attack that. So that's why it's very tricky. This becomes very personalized and you, know, you really have to do everything just right. And so having uh, CRISPR technology allow you to make a really nice, robust, very precise edit in these, you know, self-population T cells that can be injected back in so you don't have these, you know, immune responses to a foreign invading cell because these are your own cells, again, that, you're, that are being re-injected back into you. They've just been modified through the gene editing. And so this is just an amazing way. It's very expensive at the moment, but over years, hopefully become more effective. And so then you have treatments for cancer that require absolutely no broad scale treatments like chemotherapy or radiation. So it's very specific. You can basically cure a cancer that is currently incurable um, with this kind of technology. So it's pretty amazing. Very cool. Thank you, George. Sure. Okay. You may not be an expert, but he explains it better than I do. So that's, that's the criteria. <laughs> Um, so one of the other therapies that we're looking at is this um, non-germ cell line uh, sickle cell therapy. And with this one, they treat patients with sickle cell anemia. And um, we actually have this as part of our capstone project in the Out of the Blue Kit. You should be able to access this for free. Just download that and you can get that whole capstone project in there. Um, so uh, hem hematopoietic stem cells are taken from the patient's bone marrow and they're modified using CRISPR and that replaces the mutation that causes uh, the sickle cells with the wild type form. And then they're reimplanted and so that kind of skews the patient's um, ratio of normal shaped blood cells to sickle shaped cells, right? So that's one of the things that we're, um, that we're doing now too. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the ag approaches. Um, of course, this is a type of um, genetic modification. This is, I'm sure, a hot topic for your students as GMOs. Um, and this is really an interesting uh, bit of um, regulation weirdness is that um, we already have CRISPR mushrooms on the market. They don't brown. So they um, edited an enzyme that causes browning in the mushrooms. And because they didn't introduce any foreign DNA, um, those aren't considered genetically modified organisms by the FDA. 
which is interesting because, uh, uh, you know, people that are tend to be opposed to genetically modified organisms, um, I think, are were a little bit disappointed by this. Um, but the the thought process here is that they are just, you know, if you're upregulating or downregulating genes that the organism normally has, you haven't really, you know, tweaked with the DNA that much, right? Um, so this is, you know, another whole area, this is a whole class worth of conversation of the regulation around gene edited, CRISPR gene edited foods. Um, if you look back in the history, there's some great videos on YouTube on this, but one of the ways that we found this, um, this whole CRISPR process, which happens in bacteria, is from DuPont. And so DuPont is, um, they're, they're making yogurts and, and cheeses, right? They use bacteria to make those. And it's very important for those bacteria to live, right? They wanna have bacteria that are doing the right thing, making the cheese and the yogurt the way they want. Um, one of the things that is bad for bacteria is bacteriophages, little viruses that infect bacteria. So they wanna minimize that. Um, and one of the guys that was working on this and his name is escaping me at the moment. I don't know, I don't think I write in my notes or I'd tell you. Someone will put in the chat. Um, he kind of realized that he kept seeing these same sequences come up in the, um, when he was sequencing the bacteria, he was seeing virus sequences come up in there. And that was weird. You know, he'd recognize those sequences and they were, they were, they were bacteriophage sequences. Um, and that's one of the light bulbs that went off in this whole process of discovery was that bacteria were actually chopping up those bacteriophage DNA and inserting that into their own genome. And that's where that adaptive immunity comes in. So once they had gotten that piece of, of viral DNA and put it in their own genome, they then had a way to kind of target that virus the next time it infected and say, whoa, whoa, whoa nope, you're not coming in here. We're gonna chop you up immediately, right? So that's that form of adaptive immunity. Um, and so what DuPont did was they started challenging the bacteria with different phages. And the more phages they introduced to the bacteria, the more resistant the bacteria became because they had this um, this ability to add that piece of DNA into their genome and remember it the next time they encountered it. So what they were able to do was come up with these really resistant bacteria um, to all these different phages, right? And this was a, a really big deal, obviously for DuPont. Um, and it was a huge step forward in our understanding of how the CRISPR and Cas9 system works as well. Um, I, I'll, I'll see if I can find that video in the chat at the end and post it in here. It's only 10 minutes or so. It's really, really well done um, about the guy that discovered this. So anyway, okay. So now, oops, wrong thing. Okay. So CRISPR and agriculture. Um, again, just in the chat, I think, since it's hard to it's hard to get all your all your words into the into the slide itself, but into the chat, if you don't mind, take a minute. It doesn't have to be one of these crops. It could be something else, but these are just kind of there to um, you know help you brainstorm a little bit. Think of a crop that you would like to modify in some way and how you would modify it. You don't have to get into the nitty gritty of changing X gene, just what would you do, right? Um, so I'll just give you an example of apples. Like you cut them up and they turn brown, right? So the alteration would be that they don't turn brown and um, you know you can modify the gene that causes that browning, right? So go ahead and take in the chat and someone wants to add flavor to coffee. I'm not a coffee person, so I would get rid of the bitterness. Okay, I'm gonna look over there in the chat and see what you guys are coming up with. Oh, tomatoes that grow year round, but taste good. Erin, you're in Ohio, right? In Texas, we can almost grow them year round. There's two, two seasons. Make my avocado last longer. Yes, longer than the five minutes that it's ripe for. Pigmented cotton, how fun would that be? Oh my gosh, yeah. Broccoli's with cheese flavor built in for kids. I love it, I love it. Save the bananas. <laughs> oh, chocolate puss coffee. All right, now we're talking. All right, so, so your students are gonna come up with all kinds of cool things, right? So I love these ideas. I'm just gonna let you um, uh, keep adding those to the chat here. Um, 
but it's it's always fun to let them kind of play around with how they would design crops if they were given a chance. You know, a lot of the crops that we've looked at genetically engineering are doing things like drought resistance, right? Really practical things that help crops grow in areas where it's hard for them to grow. Um, and um, adding vitamins, things like that. So let's take a look at where the status is on some of these right now. Is, oh, hold on, I gotta clear all stuff out again. Clear all drawings. Okay, so that apples, we have the non-browning. Those are actually in stores already. I haven't seen them. Have you guys seen them in stores? Damon, have you seen them? I haven't seen those or the mushrooms. I keep looking. Um, potatoes, you know, when you cut those, they get that nasty gray brown stuff. So that's in concept being developed. Um, coffee, I don't know if you've ever looked into what happens when you decaffeinate coffee, but it's some nasty stuff. Uh, the process for that is not, um, it's not great, right? And so if there's a way that you could grow coffee beans that are just naturally uh, low in caffeine or don't have any caffeine, wouldn't that be great, right? You could have decaffeinated coffee with all that nasty processing going on. Um, broccoli, you know, maybe reducing some of the, the um, was it the sulfonoids that make them kind of stinky? Um, my son went on a broccoli kick for a while because he was like doing weightlifting and stuff. And every night he'd come in and microwave broccoli. And I, I desperately wish we had had something like that because it's no fun to go to bed with that. Okay, so uh, this is one that we talk about too. And this actually isn't a CRISPR um, application, but it, it it's one that I think was with the, the um, the zinc talons, but it's a gene editing application. I want to just talk about it for a minute here. Is um, and I'm in Texas and I should know better, but Damon had to tell me this. I I'll, I'll confess, I didn't realize that cows had horns. Like I thought bulls had horns and cows just were hornless. That is not the case. Okay, so if you are also like me and thought that only the males had horns, that is not the case. And I found this out when my cousin had uh, long horns that he bought and he showed his female with the huge horns and it kind of blew my mind. Anyway, so in the dairy industry, they want to dehorn the cattle because horns are um, pokey, right? And so they tend to cut them off and that's not a fun process for either the dairy um, or, the, or the cow, right? And so there was a lot of research being put into how they can make hornless cattle. You know, if we can breed, because some, some breeds do not have horns. Um, on, and so they were trying to figure out, well, can we do this? So they gene edited these cows and voila, they got these great hornless cattle. They sent them to the FDA for approval. And um, lo and behold, they didn't check their work. They didn't do the genotyping on this. And what happened was that, um, yes, they did have the hornless cows, but unfortunately, this was with Recombinetics was the name of the company. But, um, Unfortunately, they left a little bit of their cloning vector in the genome of the cow, okay? Um, it didn't really affect anything, except guess what? If the FDA sees that you have bacterial DNA and cow DNA in the same organism, now your cow is genetically modified, right? And it was kind of the whole goal was to not have a GMO cow. So uh, they had to scrap all that work, you know, probably lots of time, lots of money. Um, and it's all because they didn't, you know, just, check and see if that was in there. So these kinds of, of little things like that can really uh, kind of sink, sink the ship here. So that's why even though the phenotype looks good, we always wanna do the genotyping as well to check our work and make sure that the genotype is what we think it is, okay? Okay, so how does CRISPR-Cas9 work? Oops, let me go here. Uh-oh, hold on, let me erase, erase our, chocolate stuff okay okay so um if you've taught CRISPR at all this will probably be kind of high level but i'll just go over you know fairly quickly and we'll, we'll have some time to talk so CRISPR stands for this clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic uh repeats okay that's the acronym there um, and the interesting thing was that people, when they first discovered CRISPR, was they were focused on these short sequences that were all the same, right? They're called the spacer sequence, or they were called the, the, the palindromic sequences. And um, they were like, that's weird. These keep coming up, right? These sequences keep coming up. Um, and in between those, there were these regions of, you know, quote unquote, random DNA, right? Those were the spacers. And they weren't sure what that was until that guy at DuPont, um, was like, wait a second, 
the spacers correspond to the, the viral DNA. Um, so that's when I kind of put two and two together and realized that, oh, it's, it's not actually those repeats that are the interesting part of CRISPR. Um, it's the, the information between those. And that's the target sequence that the bacteria uses to target that viral DNA the next time it comes into the cell, right? So um, what happens is when bacteriophages infect bacteria, there are enzymes, nucleases that will cut up that viral DNA, okay, and insert it into the bacterial genome. And so then um, the bacterial cell and all of its offspring, right, are going to have that sequence there. Um, the next time that virus comes into the cell, um, what happens is these guide RNAs are made. And the guide RNA is going to um, include that little sequence from the, the virus the first time. Oops, hold on, I need to go forward a slide, apologies. There we go, ah, went forward too much. So um, that guide RNA will um, target that viral DNA, and if it matches, it will bind, um, well, I'm sorry, the guide RNA will bind with Cas9, a, a nuclease, and as it scans that viral DNA, if it makes a match, if it's complementary to the target DNA in the, um, in the guide RNA, then it will cut that viral DNA, okay, and now the virus can't replicate. Okay, so it's that um, the guide RNA and the Cas9, which is the enzyme that does the cutting, together that can find and target and cut, make double-stranded breaks in that viral DNA, okay? Um, there's lots of good animations on this online. It's hard to explain just in a still drawing, but it makes a lot more sense if you're looking at the animations. And we have a whole playlist that I'll show you guys. Or Yolanda, if you don't mind putting that playlist in the chat, um, from our CRISPR, the YouTube playlist, um, we have probably they're not our they're not all our videos. They're just ones that we found really helpful in explaining kind of this background. Okay. Oops. Yeah, that I'm sorry. I was still in annotate and clicking madly on my mute button. But yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's just take a little bit of a closer look at the, um, the actual cutting tool here, right? So there's a protein called Cas9. There's actually other Cas's as well. Um, we're just going to use the one that was kind of, um, it's the one that we use in our lab. It's also the, the most commonly used one. Um, there's probably ones now that are becoming more commonly used, but this was the one for many years that, that most people were using. So Cas9 is a nuclease. It'll cut DNA but it needs to have some direction. It doesn't just cut willy-nilly, right? Um, so the way that it determines where to cut is with a, um, a guide RNA. And researchers have modified the bacterial system to make this into um, just one piece of RNA that we call the single guide RNA. It, that single guide RNA has the target sequence in it, and it also has a scaffolding region, right? And so that scaffolding region um, is, uh, whoops, sorry, let me get over here, pardon me. Um, the, the hairpin loops and the target region, that nucleotide, so that's about 20 nucleotide sequence. And that's what tells, um, that's what's complementary to the, the target sequence on the viral DNA or whatever DNA that the researchers are trying to target now, right? So if we're looking at, um, uh, you know, they're trying to fix a gene for, let's just say they wanted to fix a gene for cystic fibrosis, um, they would target that region of the gene um, where that mutation is with this, um, this target right here, okay? With that uh, in the single guide RNA, okay? Um, there is a PAM site, and that PAM site is, stands for protospacer adjacent motif. Um, I don't have, uh, there, there's, there, this is a little, we have a little bit more detail about this in our, in our lab itself, but basically it's a nucleotide sequence of uh, NGG, so any nucleotide GG, okay? And that is a um, kind of the key that allows um, this whole complex to not show up its own DNA. So we need that, we need to have that PAM sequence and wherever there's a PAM sequence in the, um, the, the target DNA, 
that Cas9 guide RNA complex will bind. It will check and see if it's complementary to the, the target sequence, right? And if it's not, it'll move on. If it goes down to the next PAM, it checks to see if it's complementary. Um, and if it's complementary, it'll make a cut three nucleotides downstream from the PAM site. So let me show you what that looks like on the model. So this is where we have our modeling uh, thing come in to play here. Um, students take all these sequences, and I think this is like four different, you know, sequences, so they can tape them all together. Um, they have the Cas9 enzyme right here, and this is their single guide RNA. So it's got that scaffolding region as well as this 20 nucleotide um, uh, guiding region right here, okay? They're going to overlay that single guide RNA on top of the Cas9 enzyme. They can just use a glue stick and glue it together. Um, we have it all in the PowerPoint, so if they want to do it digitally, they could do that as well. And so that gives them something that looks like this, okay? Now what they're going to do is that gives them the Cas9 guide RNA complex, and that's what together can find and cut the target DNA. So now they take their DNA strand. Oops, give me a second, here we go. And I think I went too fast. Give me one second. Okay, so they're gonna slide that DNA strand and they'll stop wherever they see this, um, this green match. And if you'll, we, we skipped the first two here, but if you'll look, you'll see that the, the, um, the, PAM, site, the PAM sequences are all these, um, they're, you know, you see GGC, GGT, GG, G, GGA, right? And so wherever you have um, that GG in another nucleotide, that's a PAM sequence and uh, that per space or adjacent, adjacent motive. And so it will stop, it will scan the DNA that, and see if it matches the, um, the target region in the single guide RNA. And if it doesn't, it'll keep going. You'll notice some of these have four nucleotides and some have three, it's because you can have, they're, they're kind of overlapping PAM sites. So there's GGG and then there's GGT as well. Does that make sense? Okay. So let me do click again. So here we have um, checking to see if that matches. It does not match. So the next thing, go to the next one. Does it match? It's not complimentary. Does it match? We go to the next PAM site. Does it match? Ah, yes, it does match. Okay, and so this is what they can do and go through and see where they're going to cut. And so the cut is three nucleotides away from the PAM site. They can cut it with scissors right down the middle. Okay, like that. And then they have their two pieces of DNA. Okay, so um, that's how we cut the DNA. Um, the next piece of this whole puzzle is we don't just want to cut the DNA, we also want to edit it most of the time. We want to maybe change a nucleotide as opposed to just cutting it, which may just disable the function entirely. Um, we may want to fix it, right? So um, edit it, in other words. So the cutting is done by Cas9 and the single guide RNA complex. But after the cut is made, we typically want to repair it. That can happen in two different ways. So there's non-homologous enjoining where the that cut DNA basically just goes back together. Um, that's pretty error prone. You're likely to introduce some random nucleotides or um, insertions or deletions that are going to mess up your uh, amino acid sequence in the protein. Um, and there's homology-directed repair. The lab that we're using uses homology-directed repair. And um, the simplified way this works, I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty because it would take me a while, but the simplest way that I can uh, describe this to you is homology-directed repair uses a piece of donor DNA. And that donor DNA is, has, and so you can see here, um, the blue pieces up at the top here, um, that's our cut DNA or cut target DNA. This one that has blue, red, blue, that's our donor DNA. And you can see that there's homology between the blue areas in the cut DNA and in the donor DNA. And so using uh, repair enzymes in the bacteria, um, this donor DNA can be insert into the cut target DNA. And so now we have 
um, our cut DNA with whatever nucleotides inserted into it that we wanted. So that could be an insertion, that could just be a repair where we're changing a one nucleotide or um, uh, deleting it, adding it, whatever. But it's just a way for us to actually make a targeted change to the DNA itself. Any questions or any, any um, thing about that? We'll talk more about this next week as well, because this is, this is kind of the key part of the kit too. So, okay. Um, one of the reasons that Damon touched on why this was such a cool process uh, as compared to restriction enzymes, obviously we know restriction enzymes are really limited to what bacteria have already come up with, right? Like they have their little um, ECOR1 has a specific recognition sequence. We don't get to change it or tell it to go somewhere else. And um, with CRISPR, we do, we can modify it. But in addition to that, it's much more specific because that, that, um, uh, that target region in the single guide RNA, that's going to be 20 nucleotides instead of just five in a restriction enzyme, right? And so you can have your students go through the math here and model that out, how much more specific it is to use that target region um, in the single guide RNA uh, versus the restriction enzyme, you know, the recognition sequence in a restriction enzyme. Um, so that's just kind of helping them visualize um, or put things in perspective of how much more targeted this process is than restriction digest. Okay, I'm gonna skip through that a little bit. Off target cutting. Um, let me see what else I've got here because I wanna leave time for questions and I don't wanna have us go over. So let's see where we are. Let me just real quickly show you the overview for the lab itself, and then we can come back and answer anything that you want. So the lab itself involves a bacterial transformation. Whoops, I went up. And what students do is they take bacteria E. coli um, that has a functional LAPZ gene growing on IPTG plates, um, and they are the colonies are blue. They take those blue colonies and there's four different bacterial transformations that they do. There's one um, experimental one and three controls. We'll talk about more about that later. Um, but the goal here is to break that lag Z gene, to edit that lag Z gene so that it's no longer functional, okay? And so when they do that successfully, the bacteria will, even if they're plated on IPTG plates, will grow as the normal creamy white colored E. coli colonies that we're all used to looking at, okay? So on the left, you can see the unedited version of E. coli, and on the right, those are the edited E. coli that they get at the end of the lab. So it's pretty cool, very easy to see. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I've done this quite a bit over this year and it has worked every time and the transformation experiment or the transformation protocol is um, more robust than PGLO, at least for me. Um, so you get a lot more transformants than you do with PGLO. Um, you can also use the same, the same protocol with PGLO to get more transformants as well, but um, we'll talk more about that next week. So, um, that's kind of the lab. If you understand a bacterial transformation, you know, you understand how that looks probably, but we'll talk more about the nitty gritty of all the controls and what you would expect to see next week. The genotyping experiment that we'll talk about next week as well, you'll take the plates um, from the colonies, both a blue one and a white one, and do a colony uh, DNA extraction and PCR and just run the gel and look and see if you have successfully edited it. You know, you're looking at the genotype now versus just the phenotype. So that's kind of the big picture of the lab itself. Um, are there, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna let you guys unmute or talk in the chat or um, whatever you wanna do. I do know that Heather has a survey that she would love for you to fill out. Heather, do you wanna tell them where to find that or? Yep, I'm putting the survey link in the chat and um, at the end of the survey, it will ask if you're interested in a hands-on um, experience um, through BioRad. Um, if you indicate that you are, it'll just ask for your name and contact. Those will not be associated with your survey answers. 
So the the hands on is not what we're going to do next week. Just to be clear, we're just going to have a talk next week and go through the lab, kind of talk about the protocol and more about the more about the CRISPR behind it. And again, like I said, the controls. So you have a really good understanding. Um, the hands on version would be a separate experience where we mail you a student workstation and you would do it in your house or at your school if you're able to get there. So any questions or comments or anything else that you have? Let me check the chat again. This would be if you want to um, unmute, please feel free to do so. Um, yeah. As we mentioned at the start, we have two more webinars in this series for you to participate in. The registration that you used for the webinar today is good for all of the webinars in this series. Um, so you can use the link that you use to access this today. We'll send it out again next week um, in case you don't have easy access to it. Um, so we look forward to, you know, the coming weeks and this ongoing conversation. And I'm going to put in the chat our um, resources. So there's byrad.com slash out of the blue is the link to the, oh, hold on, that didn't hyperlink. So Lee, there's been some questions in chat about what, if any of the CRISPR kit you can do at home, or if there's a way to do modified experiments at home? Um, well, that's a good question. So um, as an instructor, yes. Uh, we've had instructors doing it at home all semester, all during the summer. Um, for a student, that just depends on your school regulations. So some schools don't care. Private schools typically are, are okay with you, you know, as long as you trust your students and um, and have gone over all the precautions. It would be it would be the same as doing a PGLO lab, basically. You know, they would need to bleach everything and all that. Um, but some schools are very adamantly opposed to you sending any lab materials home, and certainly bacteria would be one of the the ones that would be um, a more difficult thing to get past them. So that just depends on on the school, really. There's nothing technically that they couldn't do at home though. And the way, and when we do the hands-on, I'll show you how I prep it so that they don't need a micro pipette um, because that can be a hang up too. Thank you, Yolanda. And then, I, oh yeah, oh, okay. We have to put the HTTPS. Can someone put up the um, classroom resources one? Just the general one? Yeah, I just did. Oh, all of the classroom research? Yeah, all of them. Um, so Damon put up the one to the kit. That's where you can download the manuals and the models. Yolanda put up the teaching resources for teaching CRISPR that has case studies. It has that sickle cell anemia one. It has, I think, the modeling activities on there. Um, it has links to the videos. Damon and I have done a video each. Um, his is kind of what we just went over. Mine's more of the protocol end. Um, and then the one that Yolanda just put in that's byride.com slash classroom resources has all of our classroom resources that um, you can access and use while you're teaching, you know, from in this weird hybrid situation that you get a lot of you guys are in. So PowerPoints, videos, paper models, all that good stuff are, are linked there. Case studies, all kinds of stuff. And Heather put the survey link in there again. So. Well, thank you guys so much. I'll, I'll be ha I'm happy to stick around. I don't have anything else going on. So if you wanted to chat um, later, I'm happy to, to talk. You can always email. Let me put our email up here again. It's explorer at biorad.com. You're welcome to email us. And if you have any questions later, um, we'll talk a lot more about the lab next week. I'll, I'll have plates ready, I hope. I think I need to make sure that they're all ready to go. And um, so we'll do some show and tell and go through the procedure and controls and talk more about in depth about what's actually going on. All right, thank you guys. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, thank you very much, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, excuse me, I'm getting blocked on trying to open the classroom resources. I guess it's maybe